OK, so this is the second unit in the Phys 2320 Computing 2 series of tutorials on NumPy. Um, and as with other tutorials, uh, this is available both as a notebook and as a PDF file as well. Um, and if you're a lead student, you'll be able to download uh, those files from Minerva. OK, so in unit one, we covered how to create NumPy arrays from scratch. Um, uh, also by assembling or stacking rows um, or columns together uh, or appending arrays together. Uh, and that unit also covered ways to index an array to access the element or the elements that we want. So this unit, we're gonna cover some of the other functionality that comes with the NumPy module. Um, and I just want to emphasize, this is by no means an exhaustive list at all. It's just a selection of some of the commonly used operations that um, are typically used in scientific programming. So the first thing to go through is the uh, concept that um, you can just go and write down mathematical expressions with NumPy arrays and they just work as you'd expect. So this is one of the most useful things about a NumPy array is that you don't have to go out and write loops. And in fact, not only do you not have to write loops, you really shouldn't write loops. And in part four of this uh, tutorial, we'll go and um, uh, look at some of the ways you can avoid having to write loops um, uh, uh, when you're working with arrays. So for example, once we've created an array uh, X here, we can just very simply go and add three to every single element by simply doing X plus three. So in the example here, I'm doing that X plus three operation inside the, the F string that I'm printing out the result in. Um, alternatively, I can create another array, um, in this case Y, and I can just do the sum X plus Y. And what it does, it adds the first element of Y to the first element of X, the second element of Y to the second element of X, and so on. It just works. There's no loops required, but it's gone done the same sum on every single element. And uh, that's in general going to work um, absolutely fine. Everything kind of works as you'd expect with the usual rules of precedence. There is, however, one gotcha. Um, and that is that if you try and add arrays of different sizes, you're going to get an error message like this. And what this error message is telling you is that NumPy doesn't know how it can add something with 10 elements to something with five elements, because it doesn't know what to go and do with the um, the extra five elements that were in X that it can't then add to anything in Y. Um, and so the, the rules under which you can add things are different, so you can work with things of different sizes are called broadcasting rules. And again, we'll look at those in the last part of this tutorial. When you do have a situation like this and you need to go and uh, be a bit more careful about how you do it, then um, there are tricks you can go and play to avoid the use of a for loop, but often you end up just having to write a manual loop out uh, anyway. So um, another thing just to point out here um, is that since version 3.6, um, Python has actually introduced uh, two mathematical operators that go and do multiplication. So there's the usual asterisk for just normal multiplication. And then there's the at sign, which is used for matrix multiplication. And with normal mom, uh, numpy simple floats and, and integers like scalar types, those don't really make any sense. But when you're dealing with vectors and, um, and matrices, so arrays, then um, you come up with a, a, a set of rules for doing matrix multiplication. So again, for lead students, this is covered in the maths three module. Um, uh, and so the at sign is used for this uh, matrix multiplication, which follows the, the rules of vector multiplication. So as a very simple example here, if I have two arrays of three elements, if I do A times B, what I get out is the first element in A times the first element in B, the first element in a uh, second element in A times the second element of B, and so on. And if I do the at sign, then it follows the rules of matrix multiplication and specifically for two uh, vectors, one dimensional vectors, that actually ends up being the same thing as doing the dot product. So um, what we've calculated in the second example there is the dot product of A and B. Now, since NumPy predates Python 3.6, in fact, there's a, a perfectly good NumPy function for doing the dot product, NP dot. Um, so, uh, and you see here, it gives you exactly the same answer. Of course, um, 
if one's working with vectors as well as, as the dot product, we have the cross product. Um, and that's different again from both um, A times B and A dot B. Um, the cross product of A and B, um, well, there's a handy numpy function for doing that, which is NP dot cross. And it gives you the, the appropriate vector that's the cross product of the two um, vectors you put in. And although I've demonstrated these with one dimensional uh, vectors, in fact, the, the maths all works the same for um, more than one dimension. And there's no reason you can't go and multiply um, uh, arrays of which are two dimensional. Um, and the rules of what you can and can't multiply together follow the same rules that you have in, in conventional maths. Um, so there are equivalent functions to pretty much everything that's in the math module, but in general, you want to use the numpy versions. Um, and there are two basic reasons for doing this. So, um, well, one is they're just a lot faster um, and they also tend to handle situations like complex numbers and uh, not a numbers uh, and infinities more nicely. Um, they're less inclined to go and start throwing errors at you and we'll just go and tell you that uh, something is not a number or something is infinity. The real advantage, however, is that the numpy versions of all the maths functions know about arrays and they will just go and calculate the value of that function for every element in the array automatically. And so that means if you have, a say, an equation, um, y is sine kx minus omega t, and your x is in fact an array of 100 values, you can just write y equals np dot sine brackets k times x plus I don't know, probably w times t close brackets and it just works and you can look at it in the code and go yes that's sine kx um, plus omega t um, and you can you can recognize that as a straightforward simple equation whereas if you were using the maths functions you have to wrap it around in a for loop um, it's much less readable as to what's going on and it's also an awful lot more awful lot slower and that comes down to this ability of numpy arrays to use the vector maths instructions that are built into most modern computer processors that will just op do the same mathematical operation on a whole stack of values um, that are stored in a block in memory. Um, and so it's an awful lot faster than uh, using the, the math module functions. Um, so here we've got the example of, of, of doing some very straightforward um, maths. I've just calculated the sign of and the cosine of a set of angles from minus pi to plus pi, and it just goes off and does it. Um, and there's, there's no loops, there's nothing there, it's just doing the maths for us. Um, and so I said, unlike the maths module, the numpy module can handle complex numbers. So um, if here you, you stick in and you ask it to go and calculate um, the exponential of um, i pi, um, which of course should give you minus one precisely, then it knows what it's doing with this. It can handle the exponent, can handle that complex numbers without having to use a different module for it. It just does it um, and it calculates, well, nearly the right answer. We'll come back to what on earth this plus 1.2 dot, 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 dot 10 to the minus 16 is sitting around there for, because it should be zero. Okay. Well, why is that exactly minus one? This is down to the fact that the floating point number, including uh, in complex numbers, both parts, the real and the imaginary parts are, are stored as two floating point numbers. They're being stored internally in the computer as a representation in base two. Um, and there are some um, cases where the numbers that, um, don't precisely um, represent nicely as a, as a, as a, um, a base two for a floating point number. And so you get this con collection of small errors building up. Um, and so instead of say for example, something being 50.3, it's 50.2, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, and so on. Um, so you end up with these irrational numbers um, in binary, even if they're rational in uh, decimal. And so because of these, these rounding errors you get because you're storing things only to a finite precision and they don't perfectly um, line up, those accumulate as you do the calculations. And so you end up with a result which has a small value that's uh, a little bit unexpected. And this is a very general problem in, in computing. You should, and, and this is only why you should never try and compare whether two floating point numbers are equal. 
because you might have these small rounding errors and in fact they are basically equal but because they're not precisely equal to the last possible decimal place the computer can work in then the computer will say no they're not equal um so to get around that there is a um uh, a special function which we'll come to in the next part <laughs>